I've wanted to have uh, this gentleman on for quite a while, Rabbi Sparrow. He's on here today to talk about Hanukkah and the, and, the, and, the, and the Hanukkah season. But I have to ask him, he's got a book I strongly recommend, Pushback. I think it's a subtitle, How Do We Regain the uh, Judeo-Christian Tradition in America? It's a very powerful book, and it talks about the underpinnings of what we stand for. And the key thing you take away from Flannery is part of that Judeo-Christian tradition. Unwillingness to quit. Unwillingness to quit. Also, the involvement of divine providence in, in certain inflection points in American history. So, Rabbi Sparrow, thank you very much for joining us today on War Room Pandemic. Oh, my pleasure. First off, just get, quickly before we get to Hanukkah, I want to talk about the book. T- tell me about pushback. What is the Judeo-Christian tradition? We talk about it a lot here, but I love the fact that someone's written a book about it. Talk to us what that tradition is, what does it mean, and have we lost that in modern America? The Judeo-Christian tradition does not mean that you've got to go to church or synagogue every week. The Judeo-Christian tradition, the ethos, is a set of principles that founded America, and they work like no other set of governing and human principles. So, for example, the idea of personal responsibility and accountability, the idea of looking at a person as an individual, as opposed to classifying him as a member of a group, the idea of local control, that's very important, that things should not come from some distant centralized authority, but local control. That's the way it was in biblical times, and that's how the founding fathers envisioned America. The idea that there is a morality, a right versus wrong, and of course, pursuit of happiness, meaning the right to free markets, to earn your living, and to do so without excessive government control. Free markets, what we call capitalism, and it's worked for America, it works every place that it's instituted, and it definitely is the core of our identity. And I say in the book that in order for a country to survive, or a family, or a corporation, it needs a distinct, specific identity. And what the United States is, it's more than simply a land between the Atlantic and the Pacific. It is an idea. It's an ideal. And it's made us successful, this idea, which is the Judeo-Christian ethos. One more thing, Alexis de Tocqueville, when he came to America in the 1800s to observe America, he said that this is the ideal that has brought this wonderful success and blessing to America. And so long as we continue with that ideal, we will have that success. But if we change it, then we are doomed to failure. We'll just become like all the other societies that eventually lost their vigor, their energy, and they atrophied. Donald Trump's victory in 16 was really about the managed decline of our country by our elites. So so the question is, if the Judeo-Christian tradition is so powerful and so interwoven in American society, how did it, how was it, Rabbi, that our elites seem to have lost faith in it. When, when I look around at people that are believers in the Judeo-Christian tradition, I see working class people, I see middle class people. But when I go to you know, New York or Hollywood or London, and when I traveled all over the world you know, for Goldman Sachs, my own business, I had an investment banking finance firm for many, many uh, decades. It's the elites that seem to kind of mock and ridicule those ideals today. Why was it that the elites that were the beneficiary of so much that came off those traditions why were they the first to kind of appears to jettison it? Many of them are selfish, and what propelled them to success, they're not willing to share with others. They want to reserve it just for their group. But the main reason is they no longer believe in America. They're elites. They are universalists. They're all part of this transnationalism, and they want to be part of a whole global fraternity. There's so much more glitter. There's so much more money when your audience is the entire world. And that's what it means to be part of a ruling class. You're a ruling class, not just in the United States, if you're one of these elites, but you feel you're part of the, a global ruling class. And they do all work together. Those on the left work together. So they 
got rid of. They just jettisoned the Judeo-Christian ethos because they don't care about a unique America. They don't like a unique America. They, in fact, don't even like the American people. And that's why you see that they're trying to destroy the middle class. I wrote this already after the second month of Obama, back in 2008, and I said there's an attempt to destroy the middle class because what distinguishes America from other countries is this vibrant middle class, which depends upon independence, personal responsibility, free markets. They want to destroy that because they don't like America. They don't like the concept that some fella in Iowa, a farmer, has as much right through his vote to determine the destiny of this country as they from Harvard or from Hollywood. They understand one thing, that in order for America to survive, the Judeo-Christian ethos must survive. And in order for the Judeo-Christian ethos to survive, so must America, because today America is the bedrock of that ethos. So they're out to uh, diminish America, and that's why they want to basically cancel the Judeo-Christian ethos, which has always made America, America. Rabbi, I, I got two part question. Number one, because our our audience is massive in its activism. We've seen this this week as they've lit certain politicians up um, and actually had a change of behavior by some of these politicians. Number one, besides your book, and we're going to get that up because I think everybody's got to get a copy of it and read it. Besides your book, how can people learn more? Where, where should they go to start to learn more about the Judeo Christian ethos? And number two, what can our audience do? practically to start to push to start to get this back into the mainstream of america let me take your second question let me address that first because activism to me is the most important thing and people can be active because america is still based on local control you don't have to go travel to washington dc or always call your senator in america since it is a country based on federalism of local control. You can remain in your home, in your neighborhood, and do so much that will have an effect. Number one, there are school boards. Make sure you either run for a school board or you influence, strongly influence your school board to teach authentic American history, not critical race theory, not ideas that denigrate America. That's your school board. You've got your local library. Don't let them take out books under the name of white supremacy and cancel culture. Don't let them take out the books that you want your children to grow up to read that will bring them to love America and make sure they don't bring in those books that are out to denigrate America. There are zoning issues. Sometimes they'll be bringing in projects to destroy your neighborhood, certain public housing maybe to destroy your neighborhood. You have a right to protect your home. Don't feel bad about it. The first thing is you have to stop feeling bad. They've used the idea of racism and somehow whiteism to make people feel guilty, to lose their confidence. Don't do that. Between the school board, between the zoning boards, the library, your state representative, we now know for the first time how important state legislatures are. They determine the electoral college. If things would be right, we would be having a powerful state legislator fighting back in places, let's say, like Pennsylvania or Arizona. So get in contact with your state senator, your state representative, that type of activism. It's still America and the power still belongs to the people. If we have the confidence and the courage, the courage you were talking before about crossing the Delaware. I've been to Washington's crossing there between Pennsylvania and uh, the, the, the river right there, the Delaware River. They had the courage to do what they did. We certainly should have the courage to uh, make a, 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 a point to our local school board or run for the school board. R Rabbi, can you hang on for one second? We just want to take you through a commercial break, and we, we want to bring you back on the other side of the break and, and talk more about how, we, how people learn more about this ethos, and we want to talk about the Hanukkah season, the Festival of Light. So uh, Rabbi Spira is with us. We're going to take a short commercial break. Just so War Room with Stephen K. Bannon. Here's your host, Stephen K. Bannon. 
Welcome back uh, to our Christmas Eve special. This is War Room Pandemic, the number one podcast politics in the uh, in the country, number five, I think, news show in the country. And that is ahead of NPR and uh, Rachel Maddow, uh, all of our friends, um, New York Times, Pod Save America, all of them. So it's the reason is because this audience, this audience is so powerful, so activist. Our guest is Rabbi Sparrow. He's the author of Pushback, uh, Regaining the uh, Judeo-Christian Tradition in America. So, Rabbi, um, <clears throat> before we get to Hanukkah, I just want, how do people, I want everybody to get your book, and already in the live stream and on, on Twitter, people are just saying they love this as the best explanation of the problem with the elites they've heard. Where do you recommend people go, besides obviously the Old Testament and the New Testament, what, where else do you recommend people go to, 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 to really get to the foundational elements and to understand this Judeo-Christian ethos that underpins Western civilization and particularly the United States of America? First of all, do read the book. It's called Pushback, Reclaiming Our American Judeo-Christian Ethos, because the Judeo-Christian ethos has reached its apex here in America with the founding fathers. There was a Judeo-Christian ethos to a degree in parts of Europe and England and Holland, maybe a little bit of Switzerland, but the apex, the fulfillment of the entire Judeo-Christian ethos was implemented here by our founding fathers in 1776. Actually, it predates that. So it's our American Judeo-Christian ethos. I just want to say something to our all that are listening. We are people who have a heritage, a glorious heritage. The Judeo-Christian ethos is our heritage. You cannot, we cannot allow people to steal that heritage, to rob us and our children from it. It's a birthright, and you have to fight for a birthright. Other places that you should go to find out about it, read history books that predate Howard Zinn. Read the history books that some of us grew up with I'm 70, that we grew up with when we went to school, those history books. Read older biographies of John Adams and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Read their biographies pre-1980. There's some great ones on, on, on John Adams. If you even want to go deeper than that, of course, there's the Federalist Papers. But uh, if you look, if let's say you take an old Encyclopedia Britannica before the New York Times started with all their projects saying that America was founded on slavery. Go to the old encyclopedias that were published in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, even the 60s. You'll find out there when you read it what real America is about. This is worth fighting for. The Judeo-Christian ethos doesn't belong necessarily to Jews or Christians. It belong, it's, a, it's a value system. It belongs to anybody who wants to imbibe in it and live by it and have a good, successful life. Rabbi, tell us about the, uh, you talk about fighters, the Maccabees, and, uh, and, and what they did about the culture and the civilization of Israel versus uh, the Greek traditions. Walk us through what the Festival of Lights, what's Hanukkah, and what's the Hanukkah spirit and the Hanukkah message? More than any other year in my lifetime, and perhaps in history, the Hanukkah story, the message of Hanukkah has been revisited. What happened was in ancient Judea, they called Israel in those days, 2,200 years ago, they called it Judea. It was a, 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 a sovereign country, but the ones that ruled the world were the Greeks. And the Greeks had different provinces where they controlled different parts of the world. It was type of a, a globalization. And they got together with the Syrians, so they had the Syrian Greek hegemony. Israel fell, fell underneath that hegemony. And they said like this, enough of this nationalism. They told the Jewish nation, no more nationalism. You're now part of a universal order coming out of Greece. We're gonna have one culture. You're not gonna have any distinct culture. No more nationalism, no more sovereignty, no more distinctiveness. Many of the Jews gave in. They didn't want to fight. And they had all types of excuses. Well, maybe transnationalism is good. Maybe our identity is not so important. Oh, who cares about sovereignty? We'll be protected by someone even stronger than us, the Syrian Greeks. But finally, there was a family called the Maccabees. They rose up and said, no, we're not going to relinquish our heritage. 
the distinctiveness, our sovereignty. We're not embarrassed by our nation, our nationalism. And they fought against odds, against odds that were greater than what we are at today fighting against, let's say, the transnationalists or the globalists or the universalists or the deep state. They fought. The problem they had was not simply the enemy without, but the enemy within. There were elites then who were bureaucrats, some even in the temple, some even that were priests. And these elites decided to partner not with their countrymen, but with the universalists, the globalists, the Greek, Syrian Greeks, because they loved the glitter, the power, the money, the romance. They felt that they were above and they were just better than the common people. And so they had to fight an enemy from without, but they had to fight sabotage and betrayal from an enemy, an elite, a bureaucratic elite from within, who were very powerful. They finally prevailed, the Maccabees. They went right to the temple, which was the foremost institution in that country, which the elites had taken over. The ruling class had actually taken over the symbolic institution of ancient Judea, the temple. They got rid of them, and they cleaned it out, and they lit a menorah, a candelabra, hoping that it would last for a day, and it lasted eight days. So they knew that their efforts had been blessed by God. That was a miracle. The amount of oil that should have lasted one day lasted eight days. So of course, we are living through the same ideas. There are people, a ruling elite within our country that are collaborating with globalists, transnationalists in order to denude America of its distinctiveness, its sovereignty, and they make fun of nationalism. Nationalism is a good thing when your nation is Israel or your nation is America. That's a good nationalism because we stand for something wonderful called the Judeo-Christian ethos. So it's very relevant for today. They had fewer people, the Maccabees, than we have, and we have more power. So if they can do it, I think we can do it. Uh, Rabbi Sparrow, I tell you, just uh, incredible. What, how do people get access to you and to your writings? How, we're going to push the book hard uh, up on Amazon and other places. How do they How do they get, do you have a website, uh, Twitter? T- tell people how they can get access to you. Well, we have a website. It's called Caucus for America. Caucus for America. We've been around for about uh, 20 years. And then also I do things with a group called Conference of Jewish Affairs. We both have websites. So it's either Caucus for America or Conference of Jewish Affairs. I also do the Jewish angle because unfortunately, (laughs) many of my fellow Jews who should know better, they have gravitated to the left and they themselves have become transnationalists and they're on this whole train of constantly demonizing America. And I tell them that in the name of Judaism, if you wanna be a proper Jew, you should be a patriotic American, subscribe to the Judeo-Christian ethos, and be part of those who want to maintain this glorious heritage for this country. Uh, Rabbi Spiro, thank you very much. Honored to have you on. Look forward to having you back. The book is a pushback, the uh, American Judeo-Christian tradition ethos. Thank you very much. We're honored. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Happy Hanukkah. Okay, now we're... um, by the way, I think uh, Jack that rates with the Ken Blackwell. I agree. Uh, that, that was that was, and ladies and gentlemen, and Madeline Peltz particularly. We're going to get to Madeline in a second. Our marketing director over at Media Matters. That was not scripted. That, that was we put the show together, and, and I, I've been a big fan of this book. And this is actually the first time I've had a chance to visit with uh, with Rabbi Sparrow. But wow, inspirational because you know who the Maccabees are. They are the original deplorables. Exactly. And we are going to take back the temple here too, people. Right. I got to tell you, and remember, the whole the, the through line is unwillingness to quit. Maccabees didn't quit. Washington didn't quit. And I tell you, it's easier to quit. Remember, the easiest thing to do is to quit. Just to stop, okay, to quit. Trump's not quitting. Rudy's not quitting. We're not quitting. And we're not quitting because we're crazy. We're not quitting because we can't quit. You can't. And if you look at the tradition and, and this Judeo-Christian ethos, which is so powerful the way he lays it out, 